So let's take this to the next chapter, right? Our next guest believes there is a 50-50 shot that we have a new bear market low coming up in the coming weeks. He's Julian Emanuel. He's the senior managing director at Evercore ISI. He's been on the show. He's a regular. So, Julian, this is the conversation that you've been listening to around the table. This somewhat tilted pessimistically. And you're saying there's a 50-50 shot of new lows in sight. Well, Why? Well, first of all, because if you think about it, the market spent June, July, and half of August fighting the Fed successfully, okay? But part of the reason Jackson Hole was so jarring, first of all, it was like an eight-minute drop the mic. You're never going to hear him probably be more hawkish than that soundbite, is because it, it became clear that after that kind of rally, and the Fed is not targeting stock prices, by the way. The Fed is targeting financial conditions. They got too loose, okay? That could change if the data begin to move in their direction. The problem with today is the data moved towards a stronger uh, sort of direction. But I want to go back to a comment that Karen made a few moments ago. You know, buying it right, selling it right, multi-decisions. If you look at the last five or six weeks, the whipsaw to the upside and then to the downside was really unprecedented, only four times since 1950. And actually, the data shows that it was so extreme that sentiment is, is as poor that we may not make a new low, okay? Our base case is that you're going to have more volatility September and October, probably grind lower, and then ultimately we're going to look ahead to the first half of 23 where the Fed may go on hold. So, so Julian, you, you kind of heard us mentioning some of the stocks that are kind of in focus right now, either as bellwethers or indicators of what could lie ahead. In your mind, in that kind of environment where you could maybe test the lows coming up, you maybe have a shot to the upside, where do you put the money then? What types of companies do you look at? Do you look at it by sector? Do you look at it by growth versus value? What are the factors that go into then the, the stocks that you think outperform? So, so we, again, and, and make no bones about it, we all agree this is a defensive environment. In that kind of environment, uh, we're tilting towards value, no question about it, because even though value's worked over the last year and a half, it's still under own relative to everything else. But what we really like is this idea of return of capital versus return on capital. So companies that have very good free cash flow and you find them across industries as well as a, a propensity to give that back to shareholders in dividends and stock buybacks, those are the names you want to own because they're inherently less volatile because they manage their own volatility. I mean, if you look at around the, the idea that, you know, people put such a premium on profitability, going to this earnings season, right? Even Kramer said it. He goes, you don't want to be in unprofitable companies in this kind of a move lower. The cash flow side of things is interesting right now because it does mean that that return to capital is going to be a bigger part of, say, an investment advisor or an investor's thesis going forward. But does it matter if it's going to be dividend payouts or if it's just buying back shares? Or do you just care that the cash flow is going to be positive? So we would argue that there still is a preference for buybacks because the issue with dividends is if the yield curve is right, if all this exporting of softness from China and from Europe is going to turn us into a recession, you can't really go and decrease your dividend once you've made a commitment there. That's a very bad signal. With buybacks, you have the flexibility. You announce the program, you do it if it makes sense, you don't do it, you, you know, leave dry powder. So we think there'll be a premium for that kind of flexibility. All right. Julian Emanuel, Evercore ISI, thank you very much. Always great to have you here. Great. All right, so Dan Nathan, let's trade this around here first. We kind of got a few of the takes here from the table. Let's go out to you yeah. in SoCal. Uh, what do you think about what Julian Emanuel said? Is this really about return of capital versus return on capital? Well, it might be. And I, and I think the point about unprofitable companies in a different economic, a difficult economic environment and an uncertain, volatile market environment is one that you want to be very careful of. That being said, you know, with the stock market down about 10% over the last couple of weeks, 
I think the probability of a new low is much higher than what Julian is suggesting. Now, he goes with data. I go with gut. You guys know that. Um, no, but I just mean that. I just think it's probably going to happen in the next couple of months. Then the question is, what do you do, right? If you have cash on the sideline, and just so you know, you guys were talking about this low volatility environment. A lot of hedge funds are really hedged up. I know a lot of people are, have cash waiting on the sideline, waiting to deploy it. And my trade, very simply, in the spring, when we were seeing all of these storm clouds, was Q and twos. I want to buy the QQQ. I want to average into that. And I also will want to buy U.S. Treasuries. If you're telling me by the end of this year, if we have an ugly economy and we have a market that is commensurate with it, you're going to want to start playing for a Fed, taking their pedal off the metal. I think Treasuries will rally. Yields will go lower. And you're going to want to own the QQQ because I think the same things that led us in the last leg of the bull market are going to be the same things that lead us the next leg of the bull market here or if we go back into a bull market. So to me, Q's, twos, that's where I do it. When the S&P makes new lows, I start dollar cost averaging there.